Hello, turning to section B on the UN protection of human rights, we focus for the most part on two conventions, namely the Civil and Political Covenant and the Convention on the Prohibition on Torture. Taking the Civil and Political Covenant initially, we look at that because this has already, has already may be evident from, for those of you who have done Section A, that sets very much the standard for other conventions that have been adopted under the auspices of the UN. But in Section B, we look at the rights and freedoms that are protected under the covenant. These rights are, for the most part, what we would term civil and political. They are the ones that fall under, for example, the prohibition, of, well, first of all, the right to life. And then there is the prohibition on torture. Um, there's the right before the law, that everyone is equal before the law. There's the right to a fair trial. Um, there's the, a number of rights which are considered in considerable detail. And then we look at the way in which these rights may be enforced. It's also important to mention that there is a second optional protocol which prohibits capital punishment or seeks to abolish ca capital punishment. We look at the procedure, the procedure whereby uh, the rights may be it's, it's hard to use the word enforced because we're talking about an organization which seeks to maintain international peace and security. And therefore, really what we're looking at is seeking compliance and monitoring. Because the effectiveness of an international human rights instrument really depends on how it is adopted or if it is adopted within domestic legal systems. What, you, what uh, international conventions tend to do is set a minimum standard and then states are of course perfectly at liberty to provide better conditions, but the threshold, the minimum standard has been set. With respect to the civil and political covenant, it also lay down what has become the accepted um, way of seeking compliance, namely through reporting. That has gone through, through various stages in that, of course, some states might say, well, what is the, the role of the reporting system? And there was a debate, um, for example, was it merely to report or was it to give the UN and the UN Human Rights Committee the opportunity to probe and seek further information. We have guidelines now from the UN Committee, um, from the Human Rights Committee, regarding reporting procedures. What is it that a state should put in its report to the Human Rights Committee? So that there was a, a seeking to get some standardization. So the reporting system is the very basic compulsory. It is required of all states. In the context of the civil and political covenant, it is required of all states as they sign up to the covenant. And they would normally uh, provide their first report within one year of becoming a contracting party. So having looked at the reporting system, there is also the optional protocol, but the optional protocol introduces something over and above the covenant. It is something which depends upon states that are contracting parties to the covenant accepting the right of individual petition. The right of individual petition means that the, an individual who is a national of a contracting party can bring a case to the Human Rights Committee alleging a violation of a human rights that is contained in the covenant. In other words, certain criteria has to be established. A, yes, a state has to accept the right of individual petition, but also there has to be shown that there is a particular right 
that's being alleged, that has been breached, the complaint must not be anonymous, and the individual must show that domestic remedies have been exhausted. In other words, domestic remedies is premised on the presumption that the state will be given the opportunity to provide the necessary redress if there is an alleged, if there is a breach of a particular right. The optional protocol, of course, is independent of the covenant in that the states are free to sign up to the optional protocol at any time after they have signed up to the covenant on civil and political rights. It provides individuals with a mechanism for seeking redress and seeking redress against a state, but it does depend upon the state having agreed to that process being implemented. So that sets the scene with regards to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Now, when I spoke about the rights that were protected in the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, I did mention that there is a prohibition on torture. But notwithstanding that prohibition on torture as contained in the Covenant, it was deemed necessary to come up with a separate convention. Um, and the convention is on the prohibition on torture and inhumane treatment. What do we mean by torture? How is the, torture, how is the term torture defined? That's explored in Section B, as is the, if there is any distinction between torture and inhumane treatment. The general comments that the Committee, the Committee Against Torture, CAT for short, has developed relating to the jurisprudence and the interpretation of the Convention are examined. In addition, we also look at the optional protocol to the Convention, which sets up a system of visits whereby individuals or the places where people may be detained can be visited in order to ensure that they are conforming to a particular standard. And that has also given rise to what we know as the National Preventative Mechanism, whereby a, the National Preventative Mechanism is designed to give effect to the optional protocol um, on torture. So the workings and the operation of the Convention Against Torture are examined. And in the final section, or the final part of Section B, we look at, the, from the perspective of the United Kingdom and the United States, the steps that have been taken in the wake of the 9-11 attacks and to what extent that has had an implication or has had ramifications for interpretation of the term torture and the way in which the US and the United Kingdom have sought to restrict um, the rights of certain individuals. And we discuss, for example, rendition and the securing of evidence or the use of evidence that may have been procured through the use of torture. That gives you a feel for Section B.